good morning, afternoon, and evening, all you BC WrestlePods nerds out there. Whatever the day it is that you are watching is at whatever time it is. Thank you for tuning in to another Collision Collective review, your weekly AEW Collision <laughs> review team. I am El Jefe himself, Mikey. And joining me this week is, well, I'm going to announce it here because why not? The official full-time member of BC WrestlePod, Macho Rodriguez. Macho, I am so happy to have you on full-time. Welcome to the full. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you so much for having me. I look forward to, you know, contributing more to the group and being able to uh, jump in in more reviews and hopefully the podcast that, you know, like the regular podcast. I'm, I'm excited to join this. This is definitely a uh, you know, new step forward in podcasting and stuff. So I, I'm very excited about it. I am too. And for those of you watching, this has been a, I don't even want to say a long standing conversation, but we've been on and off talking. And it's just that I believe to strike, I believe in striking when the iron is hot. So just the opportunity presented itself, things lined up the way that they needed to. And uh, I'm happy that it ended up working out. So I am happy to officially say that Macho is officially DC WrestlePod Elite. I wish we had a graphic. It would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So happy. Bring in, I'm and bringing that course, Mofongo to the group. So, yeah. <laughs> I love it. And, of course, we can't do this without our other lovely co-host. You know him, you love him. You can find him on the Rampage reviews as well as pretty much anywhere else he pops in. Adolfo, hi. I know it's been a morning. Yeah, I, you know, we recorded at 10.30 last night and my brain auto-filled 10.30 this morning. So, yeah, that was my bad. <laughs> Look, life happens. I know you're holding down the fort because things are getting busy over there in La Casa de, you know, Adolfo. Yeah. So... I just appreciate you being here, and uh, I promise I'm not going to keep you longer than need be. All right, gentlemen. So all three of us are here. Let's get down to business. We are reviewing this week's AEW Collision that occurred Saturday, March 16, 2024. And uh, I can officially say this. This is a fact, not an opinion. We opened with a banger. This was Katsuyori Shibata taking on Ryan Danielson. I knew this match was going to be hard hitting given the fact that both of these men have been trained in that strong style of you know Japanese wrestling but more so commentary also like to remind us that both of these men are disciples of Anoki as well which if you know anything about your Japanese wrestling history is like the forefather of big hard hitting Japanese style wrestling and these two men in my opinion did not disappoint yeah absolutely uh i think it also should be mentioned that nigel mcginnis did a very good job of pointing out that this match should not be happening both of these men were forced into retirement because of neck and head injuries and they made their way back and this was a dream match for a decade brian has been interviewed in the past talking about guys he wanted to work and everybody always placed okada at the top of his list that is a false statement Yes, he wanted to work Okada, but Shibata was the guy he's always wanted to work. He got that opportunity, and we watched them start with catches catch hand style, just hold for hold. Then they moved on to strong style. They gave us four different styles in one match. We were able to watch essentially a trilogy of wrestling in 25 to 30 minutes, and it was beautiful. Uh, I... I believe if they were in Japan, they would have hit each other a lot harder. But they, you know, they're in, they're in the states, so they kind of have to abide by what TNT and TBS wants. But if this was a match that was done in New Japan or the Tokyo Dome, those like Japanese wrestler respect slaps, oh my god, we would have seen the sweat come off those guys. What a spectacular matchup! Adolfo. How did you feel? Because when we last left you last night, that was the only match you had left to watch because you caught up on collision late. So Shibata and Danielson, what are your thoughts? So Shibata and Danielson, let me tell you, my one-year-old was up all night long 
so I did not get to finish watching yeah. that match. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna go back and watch it. I just it, the, the kids were up, so I that and unfortunately, it sounds like it was the match not to miss. And, yeah, uh, I, I missed it, but uh, I'm gonna go back and watch it. So yeah, I I believe that this will be looked at like those matches that happen rarely in professional wrestling, like Punk MJF, like one of those matches that they're not on a major show but they're just special like i mean i'm 39 so i can tell you like i remember watching marty Jannetty versus Shawn michaels on monday night raw for the intercontinental championship and realizing that i was watching greatness watching owen hart wrestle Shawn michaels in like his like a disqualification match thinking like oh my god owen works Shawn better than brett does like i just there are special moments this was a special match uh i my son could not sit down he literally walked in the room stood in front of the tv and i was like buddy what are you doing and he's like i can't take my eyes off the screen to captivate a seven-year-old with this style of wrestling oh my god i can't even tell you how special that is i knew when this match got announced, I knew that it was going to be fantastic and it didn't disappoint. I think what made it and pushed it into my match of the night, only as you said, Macho, is that within the 25, 30 minutes that we got in this match, it was pretty much a story going through the different histories and different styles of you know, Japanese wrestling. And there's a lot of debate of is truly like the true heir to Anoki's legacy and I'm going to be as, so bold to say that I think Shibata and Danielson are probably my picks to be that inheritance if you will I think there's a lot of different wrestlers in New Japan right now that also have homage to Anoki but man these two in terms of stateside I think these two have been constantly amazing pushing this style and anytime Shibata and Danielson are on screen separately I'm 100% here for it then it's just pure magic when you put them together in the ring this was fantastic 100%. it was beautiful even the even even the the ending of the match the way like it's it's not a traditional end it's just a like a roll-up it's like all right let's not ruin this match by giving the the I, I don't know how to pronounce that Brian's running knee, sorry. And, you know, or the punt kick. Oh, the boost side yeah, knee? Like, yeah. even that, or the PK, like, we know what their finishers are, but neither one of them won the match with their finisher. If anything, it was a reversal from the LaBelle lock, and it was like, okay, that leaves the door open to potentially having this match one more time. And, and that's special. Just absolutely special. They ended with the code of honor, you know, I thought that was amazing, too. Yeah, the respect at the end was very was a nice like cherry on top of what was a fantastic match. And if you couldn't already tell, this was my personal match of the night. I thought this was super fantastic. And they Collision has been doing this lately is it's like we'll just throw Danielson to kick off Collision and it ends up I'm not saying it's just one individual, but Danielson for the last couple of weeks has had my favorite matches on Collision each and every week. Yeah which is a testament to him as a wrestler. But man, I'm just happy to see Shibata back because he's been out for a little bit because he's getting obsessed, you know, with his head and everything. And it was nice to see. So we go from here and the rest of the show was, I still enjoyed it, but it, it definitely was a difference between what we saw at the beginning versus the rest of it. I will say there was a lot of good story progression, which we'll talk about when we get to those. But I don't, I feel like this could have, I really wish that they put this match as the closer for the evening. I think that would have been a really good high point, but I thought the rest of the show was still fun, but we'll just, we'll get into that right now. We get a recap. Mercedes Monet has officially made her debut in AEW. We talked about it on Dynamite, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Dynamite boys are excited to see her back on television, and we are very intrigued to see what direction you know she ends up going with. But check out the Dynamite Big Business review if you want to see our full thoughts. 
which then leads us into our next match. This is a TBS Championship match. This is Julia Hart taking on Trish Adora, representing the Infantry and Ring of Honor as well. And the stipulation for this match was that the loser of this match would be banned from ringside when it came to what we got later in the evening in our main event wrestling wise of the AEW tag title tournament wildcard match between the Infantry and the House of Black. We, me and Adolfo talked about how the brackets for said tournament are a little bit questionable at Weird. best. Weird. <laughs> Especially since you brought back the rankings and your number one contender team is nowhere to be found in it. I don't know if Mox has heard or anything because... God, I hope not. And that's... I hope not, but as we saw later, BCC is probably is going to be doing some other things in the meantime. But yeah, like I'm um, really quick, like I said, and, and to get my full thoughts on this, you can see uh, the last night's uh, Rampage uh, review. Uh, but really quick, it, BCC is such an anomaly. They're all kind of like off doing other things mm -hmm. that it kind of sort of makes sense that they're not in the tournament. But at the same time, they are the number one contender. So why aren't they there? You know? Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think that's weird. Yeah. I actually thought that the Bucks should have just handed themselves the tag titles. That's what I thought we were getting. I, I really thought, like, <laughs> like, if you go back to that, when Eric Bischoff just gives the title to Triple H, it got so much heat for him not being able to compete for it, and they just gave it to him. The Bucks just trying to be heels. Just, hey, man, we're the AVPs. We're the tag champs. Who cares if Sting won last night? That's over. That's gone. We're just, we're, we're not having a tournament. Like, announce the tournament, and then just be like, Screw that tournament. We're the champs. You guys can have a tournament to see yeah, who the number that, one contender is. That is some 1990s heel shit right now. Yeah, there. but it would, it, would, <laughs> it would work, right? It's like watching The Crow. Like, the movie holds up. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I, and, it, you know, it's funny you mentioned that really quick before we get back to BCC and, and Infantry. Or uh, Julia Hart and uh, Trisha Dora. That's... Every time I see the EVP show up, that's that's what I how I think it's gonna go, mm -hmm. you know, that they're gonna be like, nope, we win. Yes. Nope, we get the title, you know. So, but Julie Hart, Trisha Dora. So as I mentioned, the stipulation was is that loser would be banned between the match from the Infantry and House of Black later in the evening. I think Trish is phenomenal. I always say that every time she's on my screen. And obviously, we could still tell that Julia is still trying to work her way back from whatever that undisclosed injury she had while she was gone for about a month or so. And my favorite part of this whole entire match is just the way that Trish kind of bends herself into Putty when she's pinning Julia at multiple points in this match. And just, it was a thing of beauty. And I thought Julia did okay, but man, I think I was paying attention more to Trish in this match than Julia. Ooh. This match was serviceable. I wasn't expecting like a five-star classic between these two, but, and it ended up being the way that I knew it was going to. Julia hits the moonsault, which thankfully she hit it because the last couple of attempts have not been the best. And thankfully she was able to hit it without hurting Trish or hurting herself. And Julia Hart still wins and she's still your TBS championship. I forgot this was a championship match until I was told by the announcer at the end of it that she was still champion because that kind of got lost in the shuffle of the fact that I was like, could have just not had the championship and had it be a stipulation just to see who would not be able to be at ringside for the match later in the evening. But boys, what did you think of Trish versus Julia? So Trish Adora has one of the most beautiful German suplexes I have seen in a long time mm -hmm. wow that is and i every time she does it i comment on it and even alice who you know she's new to to watching wrestling uh she's learned german suplex and trisha dora go hand in yeah. hand you know so like she'll watch and trish will will, will, will do that german suplex now so be like that was a german suplex yeah. so um you know i think I think the match was going well. I felt halfway through something happened and Julia either did actually ring her bell or 
was playing it off that she rung her bell and then had to. Yeah, buddy. Here, Macho, you go ahead. Okay. I'll, I'll be right back. <clears throat> so my thoughts on this match are pretty simple. I thought the match was serviceable. I really enjoyed these two women together. I agree with um, with the Dolpho that the German suplex is just spectacular. It is a lot of people tend to think Chad Gable is the best German suplex. I disagree. I believe Trista Doha has it. Um, the one thing I will say is we as wrestling fans have been given this opportunity to watch people grow in professional wrestling, and sometimes people are given the Derek Jeter treatment. Almost like we're not going to boo you. We're just going to follow in the journey with you. Cody Rhodes was given that opportunity. Alexa Bliss was given that opportunity. Trish Stratus was given that opportunity. And now we're watching it with Julia Hart. There's never any discourse about her professional wrestling. And you could tell it's like, hey, she's progressively moved and she's gotten better. And every time I see her, I love watching uh, her improve weekly. It's... it's uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's nice for us to just let her grow into a professional wrestler. It's a big spot for her to be essentially holding the IC title for the women and to be growing that way. But that's actually how it works. You're the workers champion. So go out there and do it. And I would say, probably going to catch some heat for this. I would say that Julia Hart is further along as TBS champion than Jade ever was. I mean, I kind of have to agree with you in the sense because I think, and not to go on a tangent for too long, but I think Jade's charisma was the big selling point and I think charisma oozes from her, but I don't think that she was given the right people to kind of help train and guide her. She was, by all intents and purposes, she was like a marquee. She was a special attraction where we knew what kind of matches we were going to get from her. I still enjoyed her presence. Every time she cosplayed when she had a pay-per-view match, it's still one of my favorite things ever because she is a big nerd, which mm -hmm. I love. But she wasn't really given people to help train and guide her. And she, you no, know, now she's receiving it over in the other company, mm -hmm. which is really weird because Julia is also in that same boat, but it seems that Julia has more of a base around her. I mean, we know who she is currently married to, so that helps, but also she has the House of Black helping her as well, and which I think is fantastic when you have Malachi, Buddy, but more importantly, Brody being the ones to kind of guide oh, you too. Those three are phenomenal in-ring talent. And you know, they have become her surrogate family while she's on the road, and we've learned about this multiple times, especially when Renee interviewed Brody King and Brody and his wife have unofficially become Julia's wrestling on the road parents. So, yeah. But I agree. I thought this match was serviceable. Julia is still your champion and Trish is banned from the match later in the evening. Yeah, uh, I really just want to uh, touch on Julia's character work. Yeah. Uh, and how her... You know, it, it seems like it, it's it's easy to kind of play off when she first came and, you know, she was, ooh, that, you know, non-speaking spooky girl, you know, but, like, she has, again, like, my wife, that's my spooky bitch, you know, like, she's earned that title, um, and I feel that that speaks to her character work, um, which is important, you know. Um, it's going to be interesting to see now that you have Mercedes Monet in the mix, how that is going to push Julia uh, in in terms of her um, her wrestling mm -hmm. and, and her and her character, you know, uh, because. You know Mercedes Monet is gunning for that icy title, mm -hmm. right? So like, not say not saying that Julie has to up her game, but you know it's going to be interesting to see where the next progression in her wrestling is going to be. Um, and then also, um, and I'm just going to touch on it now, but I don't the infantry 
are good wrestlers. Trisha Dora is a great wrestler. Um, you know, again, watching them on ROH, you get a better, um, you know, a better vision of what they can do. Uh, even though Trish, uh, beautiful um, in this match versus Julia Hart, I'm worried that they're gonna bring the infantry to be the AEW jobbers for you know wherever they are, like Trish Trish Adora in the in the women's division or the the um, um, uh, the other two in the tag team. So. Uh, which I personally don't think they deserve. I think, you know, as example of last night, you know, Trish Dorr is a fantastic, fantastic wrestler. And if, if we're going to give her some, some lumps in the beginning, okay, but let's, you know, let's push her, you know, yeah. because she can, she does have it to be a star. Yeah. I, uh, I actually think Julia Hart and, and Mercedes are actually a perfect match because they're both really good at what the other one's really bad at. And, uh, Mercedes is a really good in-ring performer, but she might be one of the worst talkers in the history of professional wrestling. And when I when I listened to her promo on Wednesday, I thought to myself, I was like, this is why you didn't get Becky money. Because you can't cut a promo. It, it reminds me of that John Cena promo where he's like, it took you five years to cut a half decent promo. I'm still waiting for that from Mercedes. Like, I really feel like she needs to up her game. And I feel like she plays this character and she's really good at the in-ring work. But Julia Hart has mastered the charisma. She's mastered the promo. She's kind of done that first. And hopefully the both of them can kind of mirror off each other. And if Mercedes is a lot more real, then I think that she might come off better. You know, maybe pronounce words correctly. Like, I don't understand how the word M-E, when it comes out of her mouth, says Mia. But that's what she says. It's really strange. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think she'll elevate Julia Hart's style. But um, I'm hoping that maybe she picks up some charisma, like, picks up, like, some promo skills here. Because there are some really great talkers in AEW. I mean, you have Adam Copeland, MJF. Julia Hart can be announced as that. Saray is a phenomenal talker. I mean, they're a Britt Baker. I mean, just spend time with Britt Baker. That's it. That's all you have to do. I mean, yeah. Uh, or or talk to Ruby because Ruby Ruby's come along with her promo stuff. You know. Oh, absolutely. Well, speaking of Ruby, so let's get into this. And we're gonna combine these two backstage segments because they're telling the same mm -hmm. story. So after the TBS Championship match. the we go head backstage with, you know, our favorite backstage correspondent, Lexi. Lexi and Renee are like two of our favorites here at BC WrestlePod backstage correspondents. They're fantastic. But Lexi is backstage with Zack Knight and Harley Cameron, minus a Soraya. We're talking about this promo and we're supposed to get a match between Zack Knight and Cool Hand Ange later in the evening. But Zack's like, nah, I'm not about to do that. But she finally actually speaks the English language because the last two weeks has been nothing but guttural growls and like meathead mm -hmm. talk. I was just like, thank you for letting the man speak. Though I do believe he still needs a little bit of work because he ended up repeating himself and kind of circling around towards the end by saying the exact same thing differently. But he's not giving Cool Hand Ange this match. And Harley Cameron is just a weirdo. I love her. This, she's just like this weird chaos factor in this whole thing. Which then, I'm going to combine this. Later in the evening, we see Cool Hand Ange's response. He gets heated that he's not going to be getting his match in Canada. And Ruby's like, no, we're not looking for a fight because then that's how they're going to get you. But we, we're going to get them back. So it's continuing the story that we have been developing. It started with Ruby and Soraya and Cool Hand Ange. It now has developed into the second chapter where Soraya's brother, Zach, is now in the mix. So is Harley and... This is the weird. This is a weird family dysfunction storyline that I actually really enjoy. Yeah. It's so stupid, but I love it. I'm very interested to hear thoughts because me and Adolfo love the crap out of this storyline, even though it's kind of dumb. It's like cheesy Dawson's Creek is what we call it. It's AEW's Dawson's Creek yeah, version. I, yep, testosterone filled Dawson's Creek. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's 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 interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing it. I, if I could just be like a straight up Mark real quick just tell you like a massive dislike i don't like zach knight and and i'll tell you why 
he ruined Pete Dunne for me. I have never been able to look at Pete Dunne seriously ever since I watched that movie. Because if you remember at the tryout, it's Pete Dunne's character that's next to him where he's like, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. And then like Pete Dunne's character is like, I'm a boy or I'm a man. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, just I've always thought of him that way. So it's like, oh, yeah, OK, Pete Dunne. Like, yeah, he's just really tiny. Like, I, I can't. Zach, Zach has just ruined him for me. So I'm hoping he's a good professional wrestler. And I would love to see the page turner done correctly because apparently that's his finisher. And Soraya never could hit it right. So I'm, I'm excited for that. I love the Ruby Soho thing. I love that like it's Ruby and Soraya because they're two completely underutilized talents on this roster. And they're making their own thing. And that's what seems to be super successful in AEW. It's people that make their own storyline. Let them go out there, and and, and I'm going to be a Soraya fan to the day I die, so I don't care. <laughs> I, uh, I've seen all of her I... movies. All of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Not going to comment on that one? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just going to say how I'm tickled pink at how Harley Cameron is coming off. She reminds me. There's a if if you watch the animated series Has Been Hotel on on Amazon, she reminds. There's a, this little character. It's a one-eyed little like uh, demon butleress character who's just unhinged and psychotic and wants to stab everyone, mm. and it's fantastic. And Harley Cameron is like a live action uh, of that character. Uh, and it just, it, it, I'm, I'm at first, I wasn't sure I liked it, but now it has grown on me and I, and I'm, I'm here for unhinged Harley Cameron in the background. Uh, Zach Knight, you know, again, even with, I'm happy that they let him speak mm -hmm. last night, but even after hearing him speak, it was still a 180 from uh, the times that I've seen him talk in, in, in ROH, you know? Like, I'm I'm at the point of, if you're gonna make him this growling, like, r roid rage character, like, dress him up like a barbarian or, or, or something, or like, stick a whole bunch of, like, spikes on him or something like that. Um, if, or, you know, if, yeah, I just I, I I just don't think he's found his whatever character niche he's he's trying he's trying to get you know. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I'm 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 here for it. Give me give me give me the uh give me testosterone Dawson's Creek. I'm ready. Yeah. Testosterone Dawson's Creek. Okay. <laughs> That's a new one. I am excited to see whenever we get the inevitable match, which obviously is going to re lead to Ruby and Soraya, hopefully down the line as well, which is super fantastic. All right, so let's talk about this next match because on paper, this should have been great, but I was severely underwhelmed. I still enjoyed it, but I thought both men would give more. Daniel Garcia versus Tiger Style Lee Moriarty. I... <laughs> I wanted more from this match. I really did. I think Daniel's great. I think Lee is great. And this was a serviceable match, but I don't know. There was something missing from this match. I was like, I can't quite put my finger on it. And maybe you gents can help me out. But I felt very underwhelmed. And I don't know if it's because we have relegated Daniel Garcia away from the TNT Championship since Copeland and Cage are currently involved with that. Or it's the fact that Lee has been losing a lot same thing with shane taylor i'm like i don't know i thought the match was serviceable but maybe your gents can help me figure out of why i felt wanting more by the end of this well i don't think shane taylor's losses are as impactful as lee moriarty lee moriarty's become enhancement talent that is the best way to put it he's become the guy that just goes out there and takes losses but shane taylor i believe it's setting up or i hope that's my hope is that it's setting up for something better 
Uh, the only thing this does to me is makes me question how far along Danny is in his uh, professional wrestling career because he should be able to take someone as gifted as Lee and be able to give us a really solid match. This felt rushed. It felt like they had just put the match together like in the gorilla position. They came out and they were like, let's just go do this real quick. And uh, I don't know. I think guys that are this young need to plan out their matches, you know, at least spots. Like, you don't need to plan out, like, minute one to minute eight. But, like, okay, this is your big stuff. This is my big stuff. I'll work from the bottom. Like, this was this was definitely, like, it was, like, student wrestling 101 where everybody's trying to do everything in the match. It, it, it felt like I was watching a Young Bucks match. That's what it felt like. It was very strange. Disappointing and for these two guys who I really like. Yeah. Um, it's interesting how you mentioned the uh, Lee Moriarty um, is developmentality yeah. because uh, Alice is Alice. Again, Alice is, you know, brand new and, and learning the terminology and all that. As she was sitting there watching it, she's like, I recognize Lee Moriarty. Are they making him into, what do you call it, a jobber to get guys over? You know, because every time she's seen Lee Moriarty, he's he's lost. Um, of the two, I feel like Lee Moriarty definitely had more, uh, more pep, more energy um, in that match. Uh, uh, I, I don't... Something was off though, uh, because when they first came on, again, I, I remember Alice was like, who, who the f is this? Right. You know, and I was like, oh, this is Daniel Garcia, Lee Moriarty. This is going to be a good match. You're going to, this is going to be an entertaining match. And it ended up underwhelming. Uh, and yeah, I don't, I don't know if it was because like Danny Garcia was, it seemed like his, he was like half in the match, half out of the match. Yeah. Um, uh, I yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah. It was weird though. Definitely expected more out of the two. Yeah, I was disappointed with this match because I felt that we could have gotten more, but we didn't. And I, which is weird to say because the next match I knew what was going to happen, but I was more thoroughly entertained with that mm -hmm. one. Because right after that match, we get Hawk versus Aaron Solo. Adolfo, yeah. you have a thought? Just really quick. Intensity. It seems like the last few matches that Daniel Garcia has been in, um, and it, maybe, it, maybe it was because it, it was the Adam Copeland and, and Christian Cage and going for, your intent, in, in, um, for the, T, the TNT title, but he was intense. Mm -hmm. This match last night, it felt like he left that intensity back home, yeah. you know, like this, which I mean, now I don't, I don't, I don't want to delve in further into it, but that, that's to me what, the, that's what it felt like was missing was his intensity. Which I think is why I probably enjoyed Pac versus Aaron Solo more because there was that intensity from, well, there was intensity from Aaron Solo for sure. And of course it's, I'm just happy to see Pac back from injury poor man has always been injured since being in aew as we're right at the cusp of something bam he gets injured but i like this match a lot more than i did this is to get Pac back on television to rack up some wins and then he cuts the promo afterwards telling tony that he is looking for trouble and if tony can't give it to him he's gonna go mm -hmm. find it himself so i'm like I'm like, we're just, we just gotta wait for Ray because I know eventually they want to reunite Death Triangle in some capacity. So, but the match itself, I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I was going yeah. to. And I don't know if it's because of the intensity, but I also, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of Pac. I like him, but I also got to give credit to Aaron Solo too, because Aaron is pretty much by all intents and purposes enhancement talent, but he has evolved enhancement talent in a way because he has kind of changed up how I used to wrestle when you know the faction 
with him and Cody and all that all those years ago was there and everything. But I thought this match was fine. I actually enjoyed it for what it was. I liked it a lot better than I thought it was going to. Yeah. Yeah, it was um, it was definitely an interesting match. I, I felt like this match was just a way to remind the fans how good Pac is. You know, to go out there to wrestle Mr. Bailey's ex, I thought was great. Uh, I think the both of them, they, they did exactly what they need to do. I I feel like uh, Solo did a good job of, of playing his role. And um, yeah, I love I love Pac's promo at the end. Like, give us more. Because I believe Pac is an underrated talker. Like, let him talk more. Let him trash talk people. That's what I want to see. Yeah, uh, as... And I will put myself in this camp as, as a newer AEW uh, watcher uh, because I started watching AEW full time um, last year around the time that Pac got hurt. So I really didn't get to see him uh, wrestle if maybe once, I think. But um, so this was my what I'm going to call my introduction to Pac. Um, and this was also Alice's in- introduction to Pac. Uh, and again, we, we watched Collision last night and it's, it's, it's always, I like getting her, uh, her point of view because she does, she looks at wrestling in a com- in just a completely different style. Um, and a, this was the flip side of the coin from the Daniel Garcia, Lee Moriarty match where she had the same reaction when it started. Who the are these guys, right? But because of their intensity, uh, they made the match engaging and gripping. And at the end, you know, now we we now both know Hawk's name, and we have had like a glimpse of what he can do and we want we want we want to see what tr- what kind of trouble he's going to get into so um so i you know in that respect i i i feel like it it, it did its job uh but yeah no it was uh, like uh, match wise it was it was entertaining dude dude his finisher uh we have to i, I we got to research but alice wants to know if he was a, a, a high board diver with that finisher um because that um that was impressive. That move is protected. You know that. There's mm-hmm. only been one wrestler just, that thing. has kicked out of that. The red arrow is protected. Even when he hits it on Seth Rollins in um, the Universal title match, which you should go back if you really want to l- learn who Pac is, go back and watch that, or his NXT title match with um, Sami Zayn. Those matches will make you a fan. Ooh, um, but when he hits it, he overpins Rollins, and when he pulls him, He actually pulls Rollins' leg on the ropes. So he protects, like they protect the move. It's it's a lot like the one wing angel. Nobody kicks out of that move. It's super protected. Uh, He's done a great job of it. It's like, yeah, there's a couple moves in professional wrestling that have been protected over the years. The 3D, the red arrow, the one wing angel. And yeah, yeah, I mean, it's spectacular. It makes sense because just just to hit that Mm -hmm. is ridiculous. So then for someone to kick out of it, like nonchalantly, would just totally, I, I almost feel like it's kind of like the blue thunder bomb, right? Like that's a pretty move, you know? And I don't, I don't feel that that is technically easy to pull off. So to see people just like kick out of it, just like, you know, uh, as, as Simon Miller says, the, 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 the most least, entertaining move in sports entertainment the blue thunder bomb you know like like come on come on guys wow let's give the blue uh, thunder bomb its due. hell yeah yeah there are two moves in professional wrestling that i feel are so good they could be used as finishers is the blue thunder bomb and it's uh baron corbin when he does the boss man slam he does it so well i feel like it's better than the end of days that's just like my those are two moves that both of those guys could switch it up and just be like you know what i'm done with the haluva kick the blue thunder bombs my move and then baron corbin can do the same thing but Pac has two finishers and they're both protected you either tap out or you're you're getting a pin and it's great 
because the other high flyer that I would put in Pox level is John Morrison, Johnny insert gimmick here. And his finisher is just so disgusting. I never, I hate watching it. Like I, I close my eyes every time he does it. It's just like, I, Dark shit yeah, I hate it. I think it's the worst <laughs> move in the history, but it's, it's heart punch level bad in my opinion. And it, it just doesn't look impactful. Like, I'm just like, how is this Hogan's leg drop looks more impactful than this? You know what I mean? Like, it just looks so bad. Like, my God. It's just... Uh, so I love the fact that we get the... Like, the Red Arrow is so good. It's such a beautiful move. I love these crew boys, but... We go from one great promo to another one because we cut backstage. Daniel Danielson has found his inner zen. He is finding peace. And he talks about gratitude of being able to have this. He mentions the fact that he was told that he wasn't going to be able to wrestle. And to kind of echo what you said earlier in the review, Macho, Danielson, in all intents and purposes, in not the exact same words, but said that this was a dream match and he didn't know if it was going to happen and now it did and then he addresses will osprey he heard what he said on dynamite but will needs to be ready because at come dynasty he's going to show will osprey why he might be the best wrestler of this current generation but danielson is the best wrestler of all time and then proceeds to leave if we continue to use the thematics of just the best in the world as well as like this weird like trash talk but still respect and honor leading into the match at dynasty between will and danielson i'm all here for it i already mentioned in uh not so friendly terms in our group chat that i am going to be spent by the end of this match and i'm hoping it lives up to what i want it to be because danielson's fantastic osprey is my favorite wrestler of this current gen of wrestlers that we have in this right now in the in the 25 to 35 range of the newer kids if you want to put it like that i love this promo this was super fantastic this is probably my favorite promo of the evening and this just makes me love that we're slowly meticulously and strategically building a story between osprey and danielson for dynasty i'm so i'm i'm beyond pumped yeah uh Brian, Alice isn't a Brian Danielson fan. Uh, truth be told, I'm kind of meh with him. Uh, that promo that he cut last night, though, uh, I, f I felt that that was a good promo. Uh, and actually, that that got me, um, that swayed me more to the Daniel, the Brian Danielson uh, camp. Yes. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, the only thing, because sitting here just thinking about it, I'm concerned about is we know that Brian Danielson will go as far as far he, as he has to go to have a good match. You know, he's he's wrestled with broken broken bones. He's wrestled you know lumped up he came, he came out of that match last night those black those those black and blues that he had all over his body last night yeah, last night woo you know um and we also know Will Osprey will go that distance as well so unlike like the Texas death match with with Hangman Adam Page and, and Swerve Strickland where like I knew there was going to be blood and I just and I watched it right and I was like oh man I'm going to be watching this Danielson uh, Osprey match like this because I'm just I'm, I'm scared and I'm not saying that it, it's not that I'm afraid that one is going to like go stiff on the other or anything like that just like I know that these man they're going to be and then <laughs> escalation that's it I, that's all I got I, escalation I I think I understand where you're coming from too because, and I agree with you, I know, and I think Macho can agree with me in terms of Danielson. We know Danielson will do anything and everything in his matches, which is why we like him. 
Will Osprey also does that too. And there is, and I agree with you, Adolfo. I think there is a slight trepidation when it comes to these two being in the ring because we both know individually they'll go to the greatest lengths to put on a good show, but also to win. And then we're also going to see it. Now, what makes me have a little more faith in it than some other, you know, wrestlers that kind of fall into similar categories is the fact that Danielson has been doing this forever. So and he's also very very good about protecting his opponent like they do go danielson will go to length but danielson also knows when to kind of rein it back a little bit but i feel that danielson will be able to go a little bit further than he normally does because osprey can match that energy too and osprey is another one who is fantastic but osprey is also really good with the matches that i've seen over the last couple of years of knowing when to rein it back depending on who his opponent is now, obviously, Osprey has a little more work to have to rein it back a little bit because this is wrestling for American television versus, you know, wrestling in the Tokyo Dome in Japan. But if his matches against Steve Mike Bailey and Josh Alexander, the two times we got that match is shown, I think Osprey is going to be fine. <laughs> like, I, this match is going to be fantastic. <clears throat> but, all right, Macho. As the resident Danielson fan, how did you feel about this promo? I thought it was great. I was really happy that it was uh, right to the point. I mean, let us know what this match means to you with Shibata. Let us know that you feel like you're better than Osprey. And for any, I mean, Adolfo, I'm, I'm sure you remember this back in the day, but like this is 2002 to, to 2005 Brian Danielson. Him, like, announcing to the world, I'm the best. I'm the best wrestler in the world. This is exactly who he is. And I think that's the version of Brian that we want for his match with Will Ospreay. If you go back and you watch all those matches he had with Roderick Strong, Austin Aries, Lance Storm, uh, Kenny Omega, Seth uh, or Tyler Black, all the Homicide, all those matches he had, that's what we're going to get here. He's going to go above and beyond to make Will Ospreay. And I felt their last interaction in the ring when Brian said he wants to know who's the best. And then finding out that Brian was watching his match and he looked at Will Ospreay and he said, am I watching the best wrestler I've ever seen? Like that to me means that Brian, as he's told us time and time again, whether you're Heath Slater or you're Randy Orton, Brian's job is to make the next guy. And I think he wants Will Ospreay to be the face of AEW, and that's what that's what's going to happen here. He's on his way out, and he's doing a great job for the people in front of him. Fantastic. All right. So from here... Okay. I don't know how you feel about this matchup, but we got randomly Claudio Castagnoli versus Lance Archer next. Yeah. Which was put on this card last minute to my yeah. knowledge and then the match itself was a yeah thing. <laughs> i i think we've talked about it on a couple of collision reviews now like this version of claudio is not the claudio that we all fell in love with uh this is not him this is not the guy that we expected him to be when when, when he went to aew i expected him to like, I, I thought WWE was holding him back. <clears throat> I thought, this guy's going to cut a better promo. He's going to do better in the ring. We're going to get Claudio Castagnoli from, like, CZW and Ring of Honor. We're not even getting that. We're getting Paul Heyman guy Cesaro. And it's just... I'm not interested. And I've never been a fan of Lance Archer. I, I'm not... Uh, the most inter interesting thing about Lance Archer is Jake the Snake Roberts. So, I... You know what I mean? Like... That, that's how I feel about it. This match was fine for well, me. Well, then on top of... Yeah, on top of that, too, because we end up getting the DQ because the Righteous come out, and, you know, Claudio technically wins by DQ from the Righteous. And so then the numbers game, because Danielson comes out, the numbers game, three on two, and then Shibata comes in with the chair as the equalizer. So it seems that we're setting up the Righteous and Lance Archer versus Shibata, Danielson, and Claudio. Which, I See, guess I, Shibata being in the I, BCC would be great. Like, replace Yuta. Get Yuta out of here. Like, that guy, God. Well, I, 
Well, I also think because Yuta is still out on injury, this is a good... This isn't... And I say this out of love. I love Wheeler, but Shibata is leagues in terms of wrestling ability above where Wheeler's trying to... Oh, my God. And, you know, hopefully we also get some indication as to what's going on because Wheeler technically is our gear rules champ for ROH and we kind of want that title mm-hmm. back. <laughs> so put it back on Shibata because Wheeler took it from Shibata and have Shibata hold it until we get a rematch or whatever. But see, I feel like I would like Shibata and Danielson versus the Righteous more if we took Lance Archer and Claudio out of the picture, but it seems we're doing a six man, which I'm still excited for, but this match was what it was. And I have the same feeling, but I'm going to give this one a little bit more grace to the next match we got. We got the return of Kyle O'Reilly versus the bounty hunter, Brian Keith. This match was also the same vein. It was put on here just because, but I give it a little more grace because knowing about Kyle O'Reilly and having a personal connection of what he's dealing with as well, because, you know, being super diabetic and having to... When he made his return, I saw that insulin like monitor slash pump on his, you know, body when he came out with, you know, rot when he jumped the barricade and reunited with the Undisputed Kingdom. So it's been two years and I was shocked. I was like, oh yeah, that's right. It's been two years since we've seen him wrestle. Which is nuts. In this match, it was to give Kyle his first win back, you know, upon being out for two whole years. I hate that it has to be Brian Keith, but, you know, I give this match a little more grace given the fact that it is a return match. And I like both of these men, and I'm happy to see Kyle O'Reilly back and healthy enough to wrestle because he didn't know if he was going to be able to come back or not. Yeah, my my story with Kyle O'Reilly goes back a few years, I would say 10 plus years the first time I got to watch him was actually live. I got to see him at the Hammerstein Ballroom in New York City, and he wrestled with his ex-partner, and it was Ray Dragon versus the Young Bucks. And it was one of the their style, the way they, they've mixed MMA to technical wrestling. I was, like, hooked, and I've been a Kyle O'Reilly fan for a very long time. Um, I am one of the people that was annoyingly outspoken about how Adam Cole is not a good wrestler and he always surrounds himself with better talent than him. And Kyle O'Reilly's been the better of the two. I mean, every time Adam Cole works for somebody, they're always better than him, right? Like Kyle O'Reilly, Kevin Steen, like it's always somebody better than him. And I've always felt that way about Kyle O'Reilly. So I love watching him. I'm so happy he's back. I love his style because... I don't think his style is difficult to protect himself. He he doesn't wrestle high flying. He wrestles on the ground. He does MMA stuff, elbows, knees, submissions, uh, low impact moves. They're very strategic. I think Brian Keith is a phenomenal in-ring performer. And I think that you can see them protecting each other almost to a fault in this match. I I, I wouldn't give this match high marks, not because Kyle was just coming back, but it felt like even when Keith was striking him, it felt like he was kind of holding back, like almost like a free to, but yeah, I thought it was a decent match. Yeah. And like I said, it wasn't anything super spectacular, but I give this a little more grace just because this is Kyle's first match back in two years. And I like these two better than I did the other two when we got previously. So we had a quick backstage segment with Diana Perazzo and Thunder Rosa, La Meta Meta herself, which is continuing that Thunder is going to be Diana's partner when they face Tony and Mariah May on Dynamite this Wednesday. And Thunder reminding me, because normally I'm pretty good at this, but I was grateful for the reminder that Thunder never lost her title, so to speak. And so I'm just like, are we setting up Tony versus Thunder? Because on the one hand, I'm, I'm all here for Give it, it to me. <laughs> yes, Give it to go. me. I don't listen. This is one of those rare moments in professional wrestling where I want to forego the story. I am I am a legit fan of telling the story. Like the Cody Rhodes story. You know, we're getting to it. You know what I mean? Like uh, MJF and and Samoa Joe going back to the NXT walkout. 
all the way up until he actually like loses the title to him. I love long-term storytelling. I am such a fan of Thunder Rosa. I can give a shit if Deanna Perrazzo gets another title shot. Give me Thunder Rosa versus Tony Storm right now. That's what I want. These two women, because Thunder works a very similar style. She works hard. Her, like, I can tell that that's, that's probably why Britt Baker doesn't like her. I don't think it has to do with the fact that she didn't get on a plane and go hang out backstage, even though she was hurt. I think it has to do with the fact that Thunder probably beat the crap out of her in that ring. And she's never been hit that hard. Well, Tony Storm comes from that style. I believe that they would just make Tony's level rise. It would set Tony up for the future for when we inevitably get the Mercedes Monet. But... I'm such a fan of Thunder Rosa. I I would love it if she just became a full-fledged heel, betrayed Deanna Perrazzo, almost like an injury. You know, like, oh, I took her out, right? For the future. And just give us Thunder versus Tony right now. Like, I, I want that match so bad. I just want it. I mean, I agree with I agree with you. I love Thunder too. I think probably what's going to end up happening is we are going to get Tony and Deanna as a rematch, but then I believe Thunder is the next yeah. person to go up against Tony and be in the feud with her, which I am all Absolutely. here for. I can't wait to... I'm excited for this tag team match on Dynamite. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, so now we get into our main event wrestling segment because we didn't end the show this way. We had our first wild card match for the AEW Tag Title Tournament which saw the House of Black being represented by Buddy Matthews and Brody King taking on Captain Sean Dean and, you know, <laughs> all the... Inf I have mixed feelings about this match. So Infantry versus House of Black. I initially thought that Infantry was going to lose because I'm like, oh yeah, I can't see them winning over it's the House of Black. Like, come on now. You built House of Black to be these absolute monsters. And then I thought about it, I was like, but wait, you teased that it was going to be infantry and FTR in this tournament, so okay, let's see where this goes. And sure enough, I got to talk about this because we did see it on our television screen. I think that they did a good job at recovering and not letting it phase them, but that botch, <laughs> when the foot got caught on the top rope, I was like, oh, that's... That sucks, and it's not because they're not talented, that they're not trained enough, but it just happened. It's like that, at the very end, the tip of the foot got caught on the rope, and it's like, damn it, we were so close. <laughs> I thought the match itself was fine. It makes me worry, though, as someone who reviews Ring of Honor, because Mark Briscoe did come in with the distraction, which cost House of Black the win, which I still have mixed feelings about, because still keep house black protected because they didn't lose cleanly but it kind of also makes them look like chums a little yeah <laughs> especially brody i was like how are you gonna walk all the way away in the middle of a tag team match and then as you're chasing mark briscoe and then you know have buddy matthews get pinned in the ring i mean poor buddy is always going to get pinned between the three of them but mm. yeah i have mixed feelings about this and then my other worry too which you know i'll talk about it afterwards but with Mark Briscoe getting a Ring of Honor World Championship match against Eddie Kingston at Supercard of Honor, I'm afraid, and I said this last night, I'm afraid that House of Black is going to make their way during that match and cost Mark the title, which I'm like, mm, don't know how I feel about AEW and Ring of Honor colliding like that, but it is what it is. But Macho, how do we feel about this match? Because this was kind of messy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad this wasn't the closing segment because I, I genuinely felt like this match was a great way to remove House of Black from the tournament and remove FTR from the tournament. What this told me was that neither one of these two teams are going to win. That's that's how I felt about it. It was to set up uh, their feud. That's what it was to set up. That's all it was. <laughs> yeah, so... We'll see where this goes. On a side note, I talked about this when we looked at the brackets. I was like, it's probably going to, if in a world where if I know anything, FTR and Bucks will probably end up being the finals. My underscore, my, un my dark horse pick, I would actually like to see Private Party and Top Flight fight for those titles because that's the story we've been building the last couple of weeks. 
they're both one on one and we have yet to have a rubber match what better way to have a rubber match than those two be the finals to see who becomes the new AEW tag champ which I also think is time for top flight and or private party to become tag champs because they have been here since pretty much day one both teams and I feel like they have not gotten a chance to even be have a run with it so he I would love to see Private Party and Top Flight be in the finals, but who knows at this point. Yeah. Then we get to our final segment. Adam Copeland closes out the show. This is just a promo. We got the unveiling of Spike, and I was just like, I was hyped, and by the end of it, I was like, and the crowd went mild. <laughs> yeah. I don't like to play Madam Cleo, but I'm going to do that right do now. It. Do it. The segment ended with Edge Adam Copeland saying, I quit. That's how it ended, right? He says that he's going to look into his daughter's eyes and he's going to say those two words are, I quit. That's how the segment ends, right? It's going to be Royal Rumble all over again. It's going to be the Miz and John Cena's I quit match all over again. It's going to be a recording of Adam Copeland saying those words that's what's going to keep the heat on christian and it's really obvious and i know that traditional wrestling bookers like to use the phrase sometimes the obvious answer is the right answer but only that this is so past what anything i wanted and i'm just not interested i'm sure there's a group of people that are really enjoying this rehashing of edge versus christian i am i am done enjoying this i thought adam copeland was coming to aew to help put over young talent that he was going to work young talent that he was going to work dream matches that we were going to get one-on-one -on -one matches with mjf we were going to get one-on-one -on -one matches with moxley we were going to get claudio we were going to get brian yo no sé qué carajo están haciendo but this is boring to me i mean i'm hoping that the i quit because the i quit match technically is the rubber match so i want to be done with this i've me personally i've been enjoying you know what we've had with christian cage and copeland and I was kind of warming up to Copeland because he was having the open challenges with a lot of the younger talent. And then when he got taken out to allow Garcia to have that match at Revolution, I was like, okay, cool. I was like, we're going to, I knew we were going to end up coming back here, but by the end of this I Quit match, I hope we move on to new feuds for both men, for both Christian and for Copeland, because I think if we continue to go out past this i'm like i'm i'm with you right there i'm like it's gonna get boring and i'm starting to lose interest too i'm still enjoying it but i'm hoping that by the end of the i quit match we move both men into different directions and kind of keep them away as like passing ships in the night until you know whenever they decide they want to bring yeah. it back for another round whether that be friend or foe Agreed. but i mean that's where collision ends as it goes off the air with copeland closing the show so macho what do we give this week's collision in terms of the empanada scale? Well, I got to say, I really enjoyed Julia Hart. And uh, I, I thought that was a really good match. I really enjoyed the Brian Davis and Shibata match. So I feel like that immediately gives it like a, like a five. So anything else above it, um, I, I, I think the two worst parts of tonight were this last segment and the Claudio match super unnecessary didn't need to be here this adam copeland needing to be in front of a live studio audience wasn't needed you could have had him do something recorded backstage you know like it could have been like one of those like via satellite things so i'm gonna say this is a seven out of ten in panadas i'm gonna agree with you there i think this was also a seven out of ten collision the highs were the pinnacles for me like the Shibata Danielson match, the Danielson promo, I thought were super fantastic. I wish those things, well, the promo could have stayed where it was, but I wish Shibata and Danielson, you know, ended the show because I think that would have been great. But either way, I give it a 7 out of 10. I enjoyed this collision, but 
As we talked about before we started recording, it seems that AEW right now is focusing on revitalizing Dynamite because technically that is the mainstay show, the main show, if you will, with Rampage and Collision being subsidiaries of it. But I'm still enjoying Collision and here's hoping that the Collision crew continues to improve it as well because I would rather have two great shows than just one mainstay and then Collision kind of be an afterthought. But I thought this was Collision was a lot of fun. <sighs> Alrighty. Well, me and Macho are going to get up on out of here. So really quickly before we sign off to do the little bit of housekeeping. If you enjoy what we have, explore the rest of the YouTube channel here at the BC WrestlePod because we pretty much have no lives at this point. <laughs> we review a bunch of stuff which we love doing and all of us have different perspectives. So make sure to check out our YouTube channel, subscribe, share the videos, follow us all over the social medias at BC WrestlePod and on mobile at Next Level. Super happy to be a brand ambassador with them. Super fun guys getting a chance to talk with them and just bringing the wrestling community together. If you can't watch our videos, you can now take us on the go because we have audio versions of our reviews as well. So it's a fantastic time. And then, of course, if you want to see us live and in person, some of us BC WrestlePod boys are going to be having a table at the New Jersey WrestleCon Saturday, May 18th, Sunday, May 19th. We're going to have a table. Come say hi. Come have a chat. It's going to be a good time. But me and Macho are going to get up on out of here. So from here, all of us here at the Collision Collective Review and the rest of the BC WrestlePod boys, remember, take care of yourself, love one another, stay biconic, and more importantly than anything, remember, you deserve to finish your story. So we'll see you for the next review. But until then, ta -ta for now. thank you so much for tuning in to another Vibe Tribe production. What's going to happen next time? Well, you're going to have to tune in to find out. But until then, remember, take care of yourself, love one another. And as always, make sure that you keep the good times rolling. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you next time.